So I'm going to pick up from I'm going to pick up from last week. And these verses that I'm going to give you, I'm just going to read them again. I'm going to do them very quickly, but it kind of lays the concept of where I'm going to go with it. And so uh, Luke chapter three, verse 21. Now, when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was baptized, heaven was open. Let me tell you what the Bible says too. He was praying. After, this is Matthew 14, 23, after he had sent the crowds away, he went up to the mountain, this is referring to Jesus, by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. I mean, sometimes you've got to find a place to pray, and you've got to get away from all kinds of distractions. It's the same thing I was saying prior to starting this message, which won't be recorded, but prior to starting this message is, Sometimes you just got to make a commitment to find a place to get the word of God. And you got to commit it in your mind, commit it in your heart, commit it in your spirit, and just be focused. I'm going to get the word of God. I'm going after the word of God. That's my purpose. And it says in Mark 6, 46, after bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. So once again, we have Jesus. See, Jesus is Jesus. Is all, you, you find him always wanting to go and pray. One to seclude himself a lot of times for prayer, Luke 6 and 12. It was at this time when he went off to the mountain to pray and spent the whole night. Say whole night. Whole yeah, yeah. The whole night in prayer to God. Remember them good old fashioned services they had in the church where you didn't leave and you just about stayed all night long. I mean, it was 12 o'clock at night, it was 12.30, it was 1 a.m., it was 2 a.m., and you just was still there in prayer and intercession. It was what they used to call grabbing the horns of the altar, the good old-fashioned altar, and you weren't going to leave till you got your breakthrough. Amen. And that was powerful. But what was just as powerful is the other body of Christ, sisters and brothers in Christ, they weren't going to leave till you got your breakthrough either. They were going to sit there on the floor and cry with you and pray with you and lay hands on you, anoint you with oil, quote scripture over you. They weren't going to leave either until you got breakthrough. Remember when the people loved on one another until God showed up and God broke through? Mm. I'm going to put a preach on this morning. Mark 1 and 35 says this, early in the morning, early in the morning. This is a powerful time of prayer. Early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and praying there. See, you're going to find this throughout Scripture, that there's a time that Jesus goes off to the mountain, and he goes to the wilderness, he goes to a, a secluded place to pray. And it's then he'll come down from the mountain and he'll heal people, deliver people, set people free, cast out demons. And after he's done this work, even multiplying fish and, and, and loaves of bread, you'll still find him pulling himself away once again and doing prayer. There's one thing I know about Jesus being your example and my example. If it was good for him, it's good for us. And if he seen that fit that he needed to get away and spend some time with God in prayer before ministering to people, and then after ministering to people to pull himself away once again and to get back into the presence of the Heavenly Father, I think it's very important that we watch his protocol. In Luke 5, 16, it says this. But Jesus himself would often slip away, often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Now, I, didn't, I don't think I gave you Mark 135, so I'll do that. Yeah, I did. Early in the morning? Okay, yeah, but I underlined, I underlined the piece of it uh, that I didn't point out, and I want to point it out again. Because it's early in the morning while it's still dark. He left the house. But it said secluded and prayed there. A secluded place to pray. There's a variety of way of praying with one another, praying as the corporate body of Christ. But one of the most important things in your Christian walk is finding how to pray in a secluded place where you can open up and let the tears fall. You know, the Bible says the Holy Spirit helps us pray when we don't know how to pray, helps us to intercede and pray when we don't know, we don't, we don't know exactly what to say. Sometimes then that's not something always to be done in a public setting. Sometimes it's in a private setting. Not that we're not a tongue-talking church. We are. But that private setting where you can pray in the Holy Ghost and you don't know what you're praying, but you just keep on praying. 
And you're not even sure what it's all about because you don't really have understanding up here yet. Your mind's unfruitful. You haven't actually prayed for the interpretation of what's going on. But sometimes you don't want to break that during the prayer to ask God what's it all about because you ain't got to the finish line yet of what it's all about. So just keep on praying in tongues until that breakthrough comes. And then God will give you a, a download, if you will, and let you know what it was about and what was going on. And then sometimes it, he doesn't just reveal it to you. But you feel that the burden was lifted, the yoke was destroyed, whatever was binding what you got loose from. And all you know is you feel freer now than you've ever felt for weeks or days or years. And it's like, well, I don't know what that was all about, but whew, sure enough, went through a box of tissue. Remember, Power of God, come on, uh, my associate pastor, who's pastoring now up there in Minnesota, Power of God hit him, and what did he do? He tried to run to the prayer room. Because when the anointing would hit strong enough, he crumbled like a baby and crumbled to the floor and just bawl and cry. So, yeah, so he would run. And he watches these. He watches these broadcasts, comments back to me on them. But he just crumbled on the floor and just, just cry, just roll back and forth. So he tried to run to the prayer room. Why? He still had a little bit of control. Why? Because sometimes God doing something deep on you today, but what he's doing on you deep today doesn't have to do nothing with today. It has to do with what he's preparing you for tomorrow. And so it don't make no sense. And you, you, you're doing that groaning and prayer and intercession. And it's not till a day or two later or three days later, you look what you got to walk through. And if it weren't for the mercy and the grace of God and the strength of God, you wouldn't have been prepared for that. But because of the strength of God, you had the ability to go through that. And you're like, oh, this is what it was all about. This is what all that prayer and intercession was all about. Matthew 26 and 39. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father... If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not, not as I will, but as you will. Now that's, what, that's our launching pad again. Listen closely. You know he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, place of the olive press, where the olive trees was. You know he actually prayed three times. He went back to the Lord three times. But listen closely. In his prayer of supplication, they call it in the agony too of prayer, in this prayer to his heavenly father, he is saying to his father, you know, if it's possible for this cup, if there's any other way, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Very critical that you hold on to that. Very critical that you hold on to it. He went away again a second time. This is Matthew 26 and 42. He went, again, he went away again a second time and prayed and said, my father, if this cannot pass, if this cannot pass away, unless I drink it, your will be done. If, if, if this is your will, and this cup can't pass from me, not my will, but your will be done a second time. Listen, saints, the reason I emphasize that is don't let shame or guilt or anybody else deter you from coming back to God a second time over something that you don't really want to go through. That you personally, you, you just don't want to have to go through it. You're willing, your will is the will of the Father. But in your own will, you would like there to be another way. Now, I'm not, Jesus is far superior to any of us, but I'm talking about your personal life, your personal life right now. There are some times that God's will for your life is not your will in that area of your life. And your will can be different. And that's why we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we don't learn the difference between God's will and what the will of Jesus is now, now that he's ascended unto the Father, at the right hand of the Father, and making intercession for you. But you need to discern your will. You need to know the will of God, and you need to know the will of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you need to know your own will, and understand those three. And I'm going to try to bring those three together for you a little bit this morning. But you need to understand those three. Because you've got to be able to say to the Lord, thy will, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I made this quote, I'll repeat it, that I said last Sunday. 
Remember, the Word of God is the will of God. If you find it in the Word of God, you know the will of God. So if the Word is the will of God, then I know if I find what the Word has to say, that's God's will concerning that situation. Whether it's health, wealth, prosperity, whether it's relationships, whatever it is, if I find a promise of God that is in there that I know is the will of God, if I find by his stripes we were healed, then I know already that healing is a part of, of the divine atonement through Jesus Christ and his shed blood and by his stripes. You see? So if I know the will of God is the word of God and the word of God is the will of God, then I know that the word is what I need to put in to change or renew or transform myself by renewing my mind to the word of God, which is the will of God. I got to take my will and submit it to the Lord's will and submit it unto the Heavenly Father's will. I know it's very important. It, it sounds a little deep, but it's very important to understand. I'll show you in Scripture that Jesus said it himself. He didn't do anything but that which he's seen the Father do. And he even said that the works that I do, he said, the Father doeth the works through me. He didn't say I do. He said, the Father doeth the works through me. So before he went to the cross, before he went to the cross, after coming up out of the river Jordan being baptized, and his cousin John the Baptist was there, he comes up, he's praying, the heavens are opened. And like the form of a dove, the Holy Spirit descends upon him. So now he's endued with power of the Holy Spirit to begin his ministry in the earth. But saints, it was the authority of the Father, the authority of the Father that was given authority to the Son to do what he did in the earth. Without the authority of the Father, he would not have had the authority. If you are not submitted to authority, you do not have the authority which is above you to give you the permission to do what you do. It's understanding authority and how to submit yourself to authority as our Lord and Savior did. Not my will, but thy will be done. And then the strength of the Lord that came upon him. Here's one of the things that Jesus said, and it's important to, for me to, uh, to say that too. If you remember correctly, and I'll give you the scripture reference. It was Matthew 26 and 53. It's very important. Very, very critical. Matthew 26 and 53. This is what he says. Or do you, do you think, and Jesus is speaking, do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father and he will? I'm talking about the will of the Father. And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. Because remember, he's the perfect sacrifice. There's no sin found within him. Satan has no right to him. He said, no man taketh my life. I lay it down freely and I'll take it up again. So the enemy does not have the right, the authority to take the life of Jesus Christ. We could go into other verses of, of the Bible and other scriptures that shows if the enemy had known what, he, what was going to happen by sacrificing Jesus, he would have never done it. He would have never done it if he knew that the same Holy Spirit that was in Jesus, Jesus was going to pray to the Father to give to you as a gift and that you were going to get the same Holy Ghost that he walked around with casting out devils, taking authority. If the enemy knew that the authority that God gave Jesus was the same authority when Jesus ascended, God gave him authority over everything in heaven and earth, over all principalities and powers, he spoiled them. So therefore, you have God taking authority, and now he has given, not just given for him to, to, uh, to use through his authority, he literally handed over authority to Jesus. And then Jesus turned right around and he, uh, he handed authority over to you and me in his name. You see? So the authority of the Father bestowed upon the Son before the crucifixion, he was operating through the authority of the Father. And then the Father takes his authority and bestows it, decrees it, and places it upon his Son after the resurrection. Now everything the Father has belongs to the Lord. And then the Lord says, if you receive him, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens the door, I and my Father will come in and sup with him. So now you have that Jesus coming into your heart. You have the Father coming into your heart. You have the Holy Spirit if you've asked for the gift of the Holy Ghost and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So you're not operating on your authority. You're operating on the authority which is given to you in his name. He says, in my name you shall cast out devils, not in your name. So we must, at this particular time... We are kings and priests, a royal priesthood, absolutely, a peculiar people, absolutely. I don't want to get you off track, but I want you to focus on right now you're not in your glorified body, okay? Right now, he has not placed that crown on your head to cast at his feet. 
Right now, you must recognize you have no authority without the one who's in authority. If you exclude him, then it is by your will and not by his will that you are doing things. For many in that day shall say unto me, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out devils in your name? Did we not heal the sick in your name? He said, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. You might have got results, but you were never in submission to my will. You did your own will. Come on, saints. A lot of you are very mature in the body of Christ. You watched it. You've watched people walking around in, 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 in ministry doing their own will. Not doing the will of the Father. Not doing the will of the Son. They're doing their own will. So that's the will of the flesh. Will they get some results from it? Probably. Apparently these people were. He sent out his disciples. He sent some out. Some traveled a long distance. And he gave them authority to cast out demons. And they healed the sick. So they did. And this is before the, uh, the crucifixion. So he had taken and he had bestowed authority for them to do something. He given authority that he was in position to do for them to go. Not in their own authority, they had to go in his authority. And one day they went to kind of cast out a devil out of a man's son. And it's in different gospels and it shows it more explicit and more visual in one of the gospels because it says that the father says that the demon that possessed my son since he was a child throws him into the fire and to try to kill him, throws him into the fire, throws him into the water to drown him, thrashes him around. He has these violent seizures. And he says to the disciples, the father said, talking to the disciples, that they could not cast out the devil. They couldn't cast it out. And so Jesus, he's saying, oh little faith, how long shall I be with you, this perverse generation? He said, bring the boy to me. Bring the boy to me. So the father brings him, the child starts to thrash about, and that's when Jesus is asking him questions, how long has he been this way? Others are beginning to come around as a crowd, so Jesus is fixing to take care of business. He casts out the demon, and always remember this, my pastor Spooner taught me this. Also, when you cast out the demon, tell it never come back to this vessel again. <laughs> Don't, when you cast it out, you also give the authority to over it that you are to never return to this individual ever again. Amen. My pastor, he, he's 45 years uh, in the ministry as a church planner. He told me he learned that by mistake one time and then many years ago. Of course, he's going to be with the Lord. But so now when he casts one out, he would always cast it out and tell it never to return to the individual ever again. Take, a total, take total authority over. You have no rights to come back to this person ever again in Jesus' name. Okay, so the disciples couldn't do it. Jesus does it, casts it out immediately. The, the, the devil makes a little bit of a scene, but he comes right out. The child is healed and made whole. Now, the, the disciples wait in privately, and they come to Jesus, and this is important. They come to Jesus, and they say to him, How's come we couldn't do this? Why, why couldn't we do it? And he's very specifically, he tells them, the reason you couldn't do it was because of your unbelief. It wasn't because of the authority that I had given you. It was because of your unbelief. Your unbelief was the reason why that you couldn't cast it out. Remember, even Jesus went to Nazareth and it said he didn't do a lot, of, a lot of miracles and a lot of mighty works, just a few little things because of their great unbelief. Unbelief is a stopper and a blocker. And so they got unbelief that has creeped in them. Jesus always, he's a two-edged sword. He's going to go into the marrow of the bone, but he's also going to go into the spirit and soul and the heart, right? He's just going to rightly divide you. And he's going to go straight into them and let them know that the reason why you could not do it, the number one reason why is because of your unbelief. Howbeit, this kind does not come out without prayer and fasting. Well, your prayer and your fasting 
The only way that your prayer and your fasting is going to have any impact on a demonic force, the only way that your prayer and your fasting is going to have any whatsoever impact on a demonic force, and the only reason is because during fasting, you have, if you will, you are crucifying the flesh, as we say. You're subduing. You're pushing away. Not my will. I want to eat breakfast. No, not my will. I want to eat lunch? No. Not my will. I want God's will to be done. And I know I can't force the hand of God, but I got to get this flesh, this carnality, this unbelief that's trying to creep in. Then I'm not too sure whether God wants to do it or not. If you don't know his word, you don't know his will. But if you know the word, you know the will. So if he gave you the word and the authority that you can do something, then you can do it. But you can't do it without him. I can do nothing without Christ. See? It's through Christ Jesus that we can do all things. That's what the Bible says, through Christ. Not through you, through Christ, we can. We can do all things, but we do it through Christ, not through ourselves. Your flesh will profit you nothing. Your flesh is not going to profit you nothing. You just go on out there and act like you're a Christian, talk like you're a Christian, walk like you're a Christian, and carry a big old Bible like you're a Christian. But if you ain't spent time in prayer with God, I'm going to tell you something. You can call it legalism or you can call it works if you want to because you're so full of pride that you don't want to do it. You hear what I'm saying? So what pride does. Pride's part of your own will. Pride's like, I don't have to spend time with God in prayer. That's, that's works. No, that's called relationship. Amen. There's a big difference. I'm not spending time in prayer trying to get God to do something that he don't want to do. But I want to acknowledge he's the one that does all things. And if I'm not in submission to him and I don't submit to him and honor him and honor his name as the disciples want to know how to pray. First, you ought to bless the heavenly father, Amen. our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. First of all, recognize who has all authority, who has all power, who has the influence of all things. First, recognize the source in which it comes Amen. before you try to recognize the keys of the kingdom in which he has given you. So many are so excited about the keys of the kingdom. I have the authority to bind. I have the authority to loose. Well, yes, but are you binding and loosing out of your will? My God. Or out of the will of God? Because there's a lot of things that God asked me to do that my will didn't want to do. I'm going back some years in my mind. I'm not going to go through some of them. But there's some people I really didn't want to apologize to for what they did to me and what they said about me. I didn't want to do it. My will didn't want nothing to do with it. I'm like, you lie, you fry. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you, 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 talking, you talking wrong about me on purpose. You want to degrade my, who God created me to be and what God created me to do. You want to degrade me in the eyes of others in this church. I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about the one down there. See? Deliberately. Because you're jealous. You got envy, you got jealousy, you got a big ego, you're full of pride. So you figure the more you can knock me down, the better you're going to look in that congregation. Because God was using me in ways he wasn't using this other individual. But that's not what God said. God said to me, turn the other cheek. I said, well, I ain't got but two of them. Come on. That, see, that's my will. That's my will. I said, all right, turn the other cheek. And I'm like, but I don't got that but two cheeks. And this has been happening a lot of Sundays. Huh? So thy will be done. Not, not my, so that's what I'm saying. There's times that we, 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 we have to say, well, we've got the keys of the kingdom. We have the authority. Yes, we do. But if we try to use the authority without relationship of the one who gives the authority, then we may not have the, pack, the power in which backs that authority. It means that we would, instead of casting out the devil, the devil beats you up and strips you naked. That's in the scripture too. You see what I mean? So prayer is very important. Never, never, as long as you live, never allow anybody to tell you that a prayer life is falling under the law of legalism. And, and, if you, and, and you know, we fall into these traps. We do, saints, because some of the stuff sounds right, but it ain't right. Some of the things. I've been told before that if you prayed once, you don't need to pray it a second time. Well, 
Jesus prayed three times over the same situation. Don't, don't tell me you just haven't walked in my shoes. You want to sometimes say to them, you haven't walked in my shoes. You're not dealing with the people that I got to deal with. You're not going where I have to go. So therefore, I can't just pray once and just walk away from it and not turn around. Because I don't want my will to be done because I don't want to throw something. I don't want my will to be done because I don't want to walk out on something. I want to make sure that God's will is done and not my will. And if I'm going to submit to his will and not my will, it might take me going back to the garden and spending some time in prayer and intercession and saying, God, are you, are you sure? And he said, yeah, stick it out. Doing all to stand, stand there for. I said, really? Just, just stand there. Yes, and without that attitude. I said, all right. Go in love. He said, walk in love. I'm your source. I'm your influence. I'm the one that will open doors, close doors in your life. I'm the one that will bless you. I'm the one that'll heal you. I'm the one that's going to prosper you. It's God that gives man the power to get wealth. Don't get your eyes on the people. They're not your source. Love everybody, but don't get your eyes on people. Because some people lead you astray, tell you crazy stuff. Stay focused in your prayer life. Stay focused in your intercession. Stay focused sometimes in doing some fasting and praying. Say, and I'm pushing everything else aside and spending time in the presence and the power of God. I'll tell you what, our world would be a whole lot better place if we would do that more often. Now let's go to John chapter 14. You're already learning something. Whew, you're about ready to pop. Yeah, well, it's powerful, isn't it? See, there's three wills. And if we don't know the three wills, we may do something that we think sounds good, but it's not God's will for us to do at this time. There's people that will try to, try, try, they try to manipulate you. They want you to do what's on their heart, what's their desire. And, and they're, what they're, what's on their heart and what's their desire could be the will of God for their life, but it doesn't mean it's yours. That's, why I'm you, that's what's very important that I want you to discern on the inside of you. There's people who want me to do certain things to promote and to help them and their agenda. And I look at it, and I, not that they're doing anything wrong. I'm just looking, you know, it's like they say, the hand can't say to the foot, I have no need of thee. See? So you're a foot. Get out there. I'm a hand. I got to stay right here. You see? T.D. Jakes said something on that lines one time. Now, let me, let me I, I, I probably shouldn't interject this being that we're live broadcasting and, and arch- archiving things. But can I be a pastor for just a moment, not just a prophet of God? (laughs) Let me just be a pastor for just a moment. 25 years I've been pastoring, planted the church. Didn't come to a church that was already planted, planted the church. 25 years, right here. So I said, another 15 and I'll have spent 40 years in the wilderness. I, 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 I've seen where sometimes people get misconstrued, and it's not my job to correct them. And they will say something uh, to me because I'm not picking up a certain agenda. As if I should turn my podium over to their agenda. And what they don't realize, and it's heart-wrenching, and it's not my job to correct them. One particular group wants me to promote this one particular thing constantly. Let's use one that's very viable. All of us are for pro-life, right? We are all for it. We, we want everything that God created to live, not just human beings. We, we even want to, we just the little goldfish in our goldfish bowl. I mean, the minnows. I mean, we're just, that's how we are. We want creation to be fruitful and multiply. And I'm only going to use this as an example as a pastor. So because I don't preach entire sermons about that one particular topic, I get people upset with me. But this is what I got to ask. This is what I like to ask them, first of all. How many times do I got to preach it before you're going to be satisfied? I've been here 25 years. So first of all, how do you know that I hadn't already preached it? I don't preach the same message every Sunday. I don't just preach the same thing every Sunday. So for 25 years, how do you know that I ain't preached it? Here's the thing they don't know. For 25 years, I have preached, you ought not be shacking. 
for 25 years, I have preached, if you ain't married, you ought not be sleeping with nobody. Have I not? See, the difference is, is they mess around with the fruit, and I just take the axe to the root. Yeah, that's, that's what it is. They don't realize it. So they get mad at me. They get upset with me. They really do. They get mad and upset with me because I will not take on their political agenda from the pulpit, realizing that I took it on for 25 years. Where were you when I said, get out to bed with the person you ain't married to? Huh? Where were you when I said, quit shacking? Because, see, if they do, if they follow my protocol, then that's not an option on the table any longer. Like Robert Irvine, <laughs> I, I shouldn't say with Robert Irvine. You know, he cooks something. He gonna dance. Well, I'm cooking. <laughs> he lives in Florida. Some of you know who I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> all right, you in John chapter 14, so I can get right back on track here. Our social distance, distancing is our limited of time together. I'm reminding myself. John 14 verse. Uh, J- John chapter 14 verse eight. John 14, let's just jump to verse 10, because I have, I have read part of this to you last Sunday. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. See what Jesus is saying? This is before the cross. I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Now look at this in verse 10. After he says what, I go where? I go to my Father. Okay, I go to my Father. So look at this. I go to my Father. So you know what he says? He goes to the Father. He's going to pray to send the Comforter of the Holy Spirit, right? Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do. Because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, I will. I will do that. The Father may be glorified in the Son. The Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will. See, this is his will. I'll do it. If you love me, keep my commandments, my sayings, as you say, my instructions, my words. And I'll pray the Father and he'll give you another helper. That's referring to the Holy Spirit who abide with you forever. Drop down to verse 20. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Isn't that powerful? Okay, let's think about this. Because I may not make it off of any other, any other, uh, other than quoting scripture. Now Jesus is talking about, I'm going to ascend to my Father. And when I get with my Father... He's going to get all authority. Jesus is. Authority, heaven and in the earth. All authority. And now it's his will, Jesus' will, that whatever you ask in his name, that means whatever his name represents, whatever authority or weight that his name has purchased and paid for by his shed blood that God has bestowed upon him, the keys of the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The keys of the kingdom, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in the heavens. The keys, the keys represent what? Authority. So he's going to give you authority. So now whatsoever you shall ask in his name, Jesus says, I'll do it. So if I can find the will of Jesus in the word of God, and the word of God is Jesus, because Jesus is the word, because in the beginning was the word. That's what it says in the book of John, 1 John. It says in the beginning, in the book of John, in the beginning was God, the Word was with God. The Word was God, basically. The Word took upon Himself flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. Here's what I want you to think about. The will of the Father, this is what you think about all week, not just a second. The will of the Father, okay. I know that above all, God wants me to prosper and be in health, even as my soul prospers. The will of the Son, okay, anything that He paid for, 
Jesus took them stripes, and by his stripes I am healed. I know it's his will, and it's the Father's will for healing. I know that he's authority over demonic forces and principalities and powers that we wrestle against, but I can take authority over those. So I can actively move under the authority of the Father and of the Son. And with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the dunamis dynamite power of the Spirit of God, bam, the will of God can be performed in my life. Because the Holy Ghost will bring the word to pass. The letter killeth, but the Spirit does what? Gives life. The Spirit gives life. Jesus' words are spirit in their life. Now this is what you're thinking about before we close service. The will of the Father, the will of the Son, and your will. Those areas. When you, when you understand that everything is upheld by the power of God's word. That's what the Bible says. Everything is upheld. Everything, everything, everything. Not some things. Everything is upheld by the power of his word. We can even see it in Genesis. The Holy Spirit is hovering, fluttering, and hovering over the waters. God says, let there be light. And there was light. See, God took his will, which was his thoughts, what he wanted to do. He took his will of what he wanted to do. He wanted to create light. And when he opened his mouth, he spoke, which is the word. Jesus is the word. You have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit operating together. The Father opens his mouth and speaks. Light be. And light came forth. When you read the scriptures, you'll discover he hasn't yet created the stars or what would be say, the sun or the moon. He's over the waters of the deep. The light came out of God. All things in this natural realm, now we're talking about the earthly realm. Everything in this earthly realm is held together by the power of God's word. Everything. So behind the word is the will. Behind the word is the will. So if I find in the word that he wants me to walk in health, in healing, in prosperity, if it's in the word, it's in his will. So now when I'm praying, as the Lord taught the disciples to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will come be done. Your word that sustains everything. See, saints, nothing exists without God. That's why the Bible says the silver and the gold. That silver and gold can't exist without God. The earth cannot exist without the word of God, which is the will of God, keeping it on its axis keeping it turning, keeping it a certain distance from the sun. See, everything is still being upheld by the power of his word. But behind the curtain of his word is his will. And his will is what's sustaining that word. If he ever changes his will, then what you see will change too. Now, God didn't change, but he did say, I'll create a new heaven and a new earth. So there is a point in which his word has spoken and his will is yet to be performed. And we can look forward to that, a new heaven and a new earth. So when you leave every morning, when you leave your house, you start praying, God, I'll go where you tell me to go. Thy will be done. Amen. Not my will, but thy will. Everything is upheld by the power of your will. Silver, gold, just starts coming to you. Don't even look for it. It just starts coming to you. What are you saying? Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. Today, just today, and I'm dating my message, but today they have released to where you cannot be if you go to the website, you can, not ours, but if you go to the website, you can print out a form. You sign up, print out a form. It's on the Rosin Report. And then you give one to your landlord. 
if you're a renter, and you hold, get another copy and keep it for yourself, people are being evicted from their homes. It's not our state, it's every state, okay? Some are being evicted from their homes. So they print it out, they sign across the bottom. Why two? Because one's for the cops, they're going to come knocking on the door, which they're showing footages of that's happening right now across America, it's happening right now. They're knocking on doors and they're saying you are evicted and they have nowhere to go. You see it on the news. Now saying I'm dating my message, I just want to just, just, I want to just hold on, hold on with me. So you see young families, elderly, that are right now being evicted from their homes. They have nowhere to go. They have no, really no finances, no money coming in. So they're being thrown out into the streets. That's what's happening in the United States of America. If you go to their website, the government with the CARES Act and the things going on, and you sign that paper, you give it to your landlord, he legally cannot evict you from your house, your home. He legally cannot evict you. And when the cop shows up, you can get out of, give him a copy of it too and show him that you have signed it and that you cannot be legally evicted. This goes all the way through to January. We're only in September. So it only is effective for January, up until January. Now here's the catch. Come January, every time, exactly, you have to pay all of it. So you've got to pay September, October, November, December. You've got to pay rent for all four months. So when people don't realize, sometimes if they don't listen, and that's what's happening sometimes, people don't have an ear to hear the true word of God and hear what God's trying to put in their heart to prepare them before what hits or what's to come. So they're ready for it. And because right now, you're being taught, and you're being taught in a way that if you, if you really open your mouth and use the authority, you're going to be able to lay hands on your house, lay hands on your home, lay hands on your possessions and say that, that I will not lose a thing. My God is my source. My, my government is not my source. My landlord is not my source. My boss is not my source. My source is God. If I seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto me. Because God himself ain't a man that he should lie. So if God says he can sustain me like he can feed the birds of the air, he can clothe the lily of the valleys, how much more shall he take care of me is what the Lord Jesus was saying, right? So I seek his kingdom first. And therefore, I'm not tied up in what I have in the material possessions in this life. I know that whatever I have, my greatest possessions is over there. That's where my treasure is. That's where my heart is. Therefore, my treasure is where my mansion, where the Lord go to prepare a place for me, is over there in heaven. But if I don't use my word and I don't stand on the will of God and say, God, it is your will. Let's use another scripture and throw it out there. Because in January, this could be happening. See, in January, when it hits... Some people will have been quoting for weeks, if not for a couple of months. Lord, you said that you would give me houses and lands, houses I didn't build, that you would give me houses and lands a hundredfold in this life, a hundredfold in this life, not in the life to come, in this life. So if a person who's not doing their will out of greed, doing their will out of flesh and carnality, but are seeing beyond and what God wants to do in their life and multiply in their life, and they're able to say, you know what? This is a time and an opportunity for me to start quoting that I'm going to have land and I'm going to have houses and I'm going to be able to afford them. It may not look like I can today, but you wait till January. You wait till January. I'll be able to select a $350,000 home for $50,000. Come on. Now, I'm not saying that. I'm not prophesying that that's how it's going to be. I'm just going to tell you, some people have learned how to have good credit. And, and, and they paid the price for that good credit because they didn't ruin the credit. Or they ruined it at one time and they paid their time and now they got good credit again. And now, right now, interest rates are extremely low. So you're going to have people that are going to be living in houses that they've just dreamed all their life that they ain't no way could ever afford to have a house like that. That's just not even on the ticket. That's not going to happen. Well, if it was on a ticket, it was on a scratch-off ticket because that's just not going to happen. That just, I can't get in that kind of house. I can't get in that kind of gated community. I can't afford all of that kind of stuff. But another person is looking in the scriptures saying, hmm, uh, you can give me a thousand fold in a famine and a land and a land of famine. I can get a thousand fold return. You can give me houses. You can give me land. So all these people who think that they're riding around on free money is just riding around on borrowed time. And come January, the people who were wise 
And the people who looked around and said, you know, this is going to happen, so why not do something about it? How many of you wish that you had known what Apple stock was going to turn out to be when it first hit the market at about $3 a share? Mm-hmm. Well, well, well. Huh? All right, I'm talking to the wrong people because if y'all had done that, you wouldn't be here this morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I'd probably be watching from my yacht too. So, well, uh, <laughs> no guilt on you, no guilt on me. If I'd have bought it back then and then I'd be having $350 billion sitting in the bank, I'd be living for God, but I'd be building churches and preaching the word and giving to missionaries and raising up evangelism. I would just multiply my work because it'd make it easier financially to be able to go to other places and do other things. That's all. God, it's still, it's still, you still have to say to the Lord, thy will be done. And he's going to say, okay. And I'm going to say, Lord, I want your will. He said, say, okay. I said, Lord, I really do. I want your will to be done. He says, all right. Get up out of that lawn chair and get that suntan lotion off yourself and go in there and get dressed because I got somewhere for you to preach. Oh, Lord, I was resting before you. You know that. I just resting before you. It was, you know, I just laying in the yard looking at the magnificent glory of What's your creation? He's like, well, why don't you quit looking at my creation and listen to your creator? <laughs> it's like, okay, not my will, but thy will be done. That's my message this morning. I hope you enjoyed it. That's part two. Not my will, but thy will be done.